there are two possibilities for invasion of our home world. The first is that Earth comes to reconquer us. We have copious trade material to help us defeat them in a guerrilla war. What's the other possibility? An alien invasion. Do we have training documents for an alien invasion? <laughs> I think we've got that covered. Welcome to Ariadna! After the Separatist Wars ended and the Federal Nation of Ariadna began, the contingent territories settled in to trading roles. Rosina took care of money and policy. U.S. Ariadna extracted base resources. Caledonia mined Tesium. All were tied together by Merovingian trade networks and enclaves. The international economy was solid but stagnant. The borders did not expand. The Roving Star satellite system did not expand. Vessels rusted in the docks. Ovsianka became a ship graveyard as the southern fleet was dismantled. This came in part because of the leading military junta in Mat. First established during the Separatist Wars, the Cossack junta had maintained and consolidated its power, using excuses like reconstruction and a series of truly harsh winters to stay in power. The junta favored conservative austerity and were completely reluctant to empower U.S. Ariadna, Caledonia, or Merovingia. Ariadna recovered, but they created nothing new. That is not to say that there was no progress on Dawn. John Rotten, nicknamed Vanya, uttered the cry for equality or death many years ago. He led Dog Nation, an activist group that sought equal treatment for Ariadna's growing population of dog-blooded individuals. Ostracized, and referred to as Metisi, from the Russian word meaning mongrel or half-blood, Vanya reclaimed the word in his most fiery speech. Dog faces and wolvers faced serious racism, and their career options often narrowed to criminality, manual labor, or the military. The conservative and completely corrupt state apparatus was proving unable to deal with societal changes, or even the regular raids from Antipodes. An underground group of military officers, known as the Volchitsi, or Wolverines, performed a coup against the Cossack Junta. This was the Knight of Kinjal, named after the Cossack traditional dagger. A group of young officers, including Yevgeny Voronin, seized power from the iron-fisted General Fudchenko and his supporters. The coup was far from bloodless, but most of the junta and its loyalists were killed or surrendered. However, a contingent was able to escape the Cossack patrols and Antipode hunting parties, escaping deep into Tartary. There, they became the Zakoniki, or the Legalists. They're based around a bandit culture that sees itself as the legal representatives of Ariadna, and still exists today. The provisional government gave way to a reformist, democratically elected apparatus, but their hopes were dashed by the Third Antipode Offensive. The native-born population of Dawn, the Antipodes, penetrated every defensive fortification and were only stopped due to attrition. The weakness of the state was laid bare. There was no Ariadnan army. There were smaller local armies, but no formal federal army. The Vojnik Strica, or the Military Council, supposedly had oversight, but beyond some very minimal bilateral cooperation in the face of the Third Antipode Offensive, its authority was almost entirely theoretical. For example, the pilots of the Vipera School were Cossacks. The U.S. Ariadne Air Force pilots did not mix, aside from the occasional friendly competition. The Tartary Army Corps, which was numerically the largest force, was poorly deployed and mostly remained a static garrison during the conflict. Anger over the poor defense of the motherland during the offensive brought about a reactionary crackdown, and even a series of small-scale military conflicts known as the Contraband Wars as Mater flexed its authority. The Ariadne military was once again reforged, pivoting to fight other humans. In the year 52 NC, the human sphere was recovering after a decade of on and off conflict. A tripolar power structure had enforced a third peace, and peace of any sort was good. The human sphere powers continued to launch space probes to explore new wormholes, always eager to establish new operations for an ever-hungry economy. The major powers were Pan-Oceania, who had emerged from the wars as the dominant power, the Nomad Nation, which had fostered a positive relationship with Islam, and finally, the Yujing State Empire. Contact and trade resumed after the neo-colonial wars. For example, Kostmet Station became a neutral ground for commerce between formerly warring partners. 
O12 and Aleph remained interwoven in the fabric of the sphere and had been instrumental in bringing the wars to a close three times in a row. One year after the end of the Neo-Colonial Wars, the Pan-Oceanian scout ship Niriti, named after a Hindu goddess of death, made a jump through an unexplored wormhole and found itself in the long-lost Helio system. To the surprise of the entire human sphere, the original colonists on Dawn had not died out. To the surprise of the Ariadnans, the very fabric of human society was also alien. Imagine how someone from the era of the American Revolution would feel, meeting modern-day Americans. Disgust. Admiration. Surprise. Maybe a little envy. Two months later, in the year 53, the Yujing military ship Lei Fang arrived in the Helio system, purportedly to ensure that Pan-Oceania was going to observe proper international law. Fearing the outbreak of war, Hak Islam and the Nomad Nation quickly moved to have O12 declare the Ariadnan government a sovereign power. The action stalled for several months, until the state empire proposed a compromise. The Ariadnans would have sovereign control of the small portion of the world that they owned. The rest would be virgin ground. The Ariadnans considered this a travesty. The Colonial Commission was almost instantly corrupt and favored Yujing land claims. Pan-Oceania took a different tack and operated under the assumption that the entire planet was territory belonging to the Antipodes. Finally, Hak Islam and the Nomads assumed that the Ariadnan government was the sole authority on Dawn and began buying land claims. All of these claims conflicted and corporations with conflicting leases began legal and physical battles. Mercenaries were readily available thanks to the recent formalization of the war market. See? It was a good video. It was conflicts between mercenaries, corporations, and the Ariadnans led to public demands for resolution. The Ariadnans would capture or kill mercenaries, which would in turn drag the other G5 nations into conflict. This period of warfare became the Ariadnan commercial conflicts. The Ariadnans had faced countless challenges before. Invaders from space were uh, different. Military training had planned for the possibility of invasion. All their training scenarios, however, had assumed that they would either fight comparable technology or fantastical scenarios involving ray guns and flying saucers. The G5 nations were neither. They didn't have phasers or teleportation, but they did have benefits that Ariadnans would never have dreamed of, like cubes. Their size and scale also completely eclipsed the colonists. Pan-Oceania's military forces outnumbered the entire human population of Dawn. Yujing aircraft had complete air superiority. Hak Islam's first generation of super soldiers were comparable even to the mighty dog faces. But this was not a war of annihilation, nor of outright conquest. The galactic powers were never actually interested in controlling the entire planet, let alone the massive tracts of unremarkable land that made up Dawn. They were interested in exotic matter and rare resources, primarily tesium. Control over the planet was a liability none of the G5 powers wanted. Ariadna fought like this was a war of survival, though. And for a few, this was a war of annihilation. The Magna Obra Corporation is one of the largest corporations in the human sphere. They hired the services of Drew's Bayram security to enforce their agenda. Weeks later, Caledonians reported entire towns being leveled, and their populations driven off or killed. The lawsuits remain tied up in the Concilium courts to this day. The offworlders had overwhelming firepower, superior numbers, and their own agendas. It was in the face of impossible odds that the Ariadnans once again united. Cossack High Command was the supreme military authority in Rodina, and they created the subordinate Ariadnan Joint Command to coordinate the innumerable armed forces on Dawn. The old Stanitsa system also helped them to mobilize a large portion of their populace into fighting units. Offworlder bases found themselves under constant threat of snipers and bombings. The few settlements that were formerly occupied by Pan-Oceania became sites of constant low-level warfare. Pan-Oceania preferred a hearts and minds strategy, providing offworld goods and promises. Yujing used more brutal methods to suppress the guerrilla war. It wasn't all irregular fighting, though. Ariadnans undertook bold strategies and forced battles on territory where they had the advantage. The fortified city of Riverside was the second most secure city in U.S. Ariadna. At least one unknown ranger fought and died fighting with the Yujing Green Banner Army. Another died fighting nomads in Deadwood. Brigadier General Peterson, the man in charge of Pan-Oceania's forces on Dawn, remarked on the cruelty and efficiency of Kazakh Spetsnaz in both sabotage and direct combat operations. 
Operation Death from the Clouds, led by Van Zant, brazenly crossed occupied territory and took the fighting to the invaders. Bit by bit, the Ariadnids began to make the occupation of their homeworld unfeasible. Plentiful Tesium stores negated the defenses of powered armor. Casualties were inevitable. Entire regiments of Ariadnid soldiers could fall to a tiny number of elite power armored soldiers. Signal jamming nanobot clouds made isolated squads of Kazakhs easy prey for the elite Bakhmari units. But over the course of five years, the tide turned. Nomads had completed construction on the splendor of Xanadu orbital, intending to use it in the Yujing system. However, they quickly redeployed it to orbit around dawn. From there, the Ariadans began to mass hire mercenaries of their own. Anaconda squadron provided heavy mechanized support. Foreign nomad instructors upgraded Ariadan aircraft and taught pilots how to frustrate and distract their galactic counterparts. The nomads had a great deal of appreciation for the Ariadans. The spacers liked what they could offer in terms of resources, but the nomads also liked their rugged character and also their ability to humiliate Panoceania. The nomads could not fight the war, however. Aleph had been given increased discretionary powers in order to peacekeep on dawn, and it used its special situation section to covertly attack the nomad nation and the Arachne datasphere. This was also the birth of the SID, or the Stavka Intelligence Department. Originally, there was no unified intel agency on Dawn. Every nation had their own intel operatives that were mostly used to spy on each other. During the commercial conflicts, the Okrana, that being the Rodinan intelligence agency, reformed itself as the SID. They then hired all the best spies from the other agencies, creating a unified service for the first time. Stavka agents leveraged every resource they had, from propaganda to bribes to assassinations, to ensure that the foreigners could not claim their planet. For example, Pan-Oceanians and Yu Jing forces were frequently lured into Antipode territory. Dogfaces, Antipodes, and Wolvers all look the same when they're running at you in the middle of the night and stabbing you with a sharp tesium blade. As a result, the galactic powers were off balance from the start, initially believing that the aliens were in league with the colonists. This is the part of the video where I tell you all of the troops that were involved in the conflict. You might want to ride that right arrow button and uh, skip ahead a bit. This is just completeness for me. Why are you watching? Towards the end of the Ariadne commercial conflicts and mere days into his very first assignment, Jacques Bruant was cut off from his unit and literally handcuffed to his superior officer, Sergeant Lacan. He managed to evade Yu Jing forces and, and Antipodes alike, but the suspicious death of Lacan has haunted him ever since. Terlach McMurrow worked first for the Caledonians as a volunteer, and then for Dachat Company as an employee. Briscards were, Briscard were trained to fight, whereas before they had just been police forces. Senior Massacre made a bunch of philosophical quips mid-firefight. He's so wacky, and I love how he sometimes breaks the fourth wall. Takashi Oyama was already a veteran of the neo-colonial wars, where he gained the nickname Neko because he kept surviving, and because he's like a cat, and he fought here. Captain Cody Horner was a mercenary who would go on to become the captain of the good ship Maelstrom for Spiral Corps. Achilles killed people. I don't know who he killed. Minutemen were there too. Bach Mari from Acontecimento were extremely effective and probably did some crime. Gabriel de Fersen was posted to the Knights of Mercy. He performed Cassivac and extremely risky prisoner rescue missions where he became known for being a meticulous planner. Achilles kills Riot Girls, who fought the elite Pan-Oceanian Achilla Guard at least once. Joe Scarface Turner, a mercenary addicted to the combat stim grade 5, used his signature Ram Horn 237 tag and did war crimes with his sister while working for Magna Obra and the Druze. Anaconda Squadron worked for every side of the conflict. Tariq Mansuri was there. Sun Tzu planned and executed the Lei Ku action. John Hawkwood almost died and got transferred to a biosynthetic body. Synthetic, vet-grown bodies are called Losts, or Life Hosts. Kaplan Tactical Services served extensively in the wars. Achilles kills again. Mercenaries took bandoliers from dead Ariadnan troops. A bandolier is a simple band that goes around the chest. Wearing a dawn-made one around Ariadnans is stupid, suicidal, or both. Nomads made bulk sales of the Dep, which is like the Panzerfaust. DEP is Descanse en Paz, rest in peace which refers either to the target or the user. And all the rest! Look at all these guys! 
As the Ariadnan commercial conflict drew to a close, a series of significant neo-materials discoveries on Svalarima led many defense contractors and marketing analysis to predict a new round of neo-colonial wars between Pan-Oceania and Yujing to fully seize control of the planet once and for all. Widespread production of armor, vehicles, and military materiel adapted to the icy planet's climate ensued. The war never happened, but military surplus remains common. The War on Dawn ended when Bureau Aegis finally dispatched peacekeeping troops to lock down the situation. O-12 took possession of the border areas, originally covered by the Yujing Compromise, establishing the Ariadne Exclusion Zone, or the AEZ, around the Ariadne Sovereignties. After five grueling years, the Ariadne commercial conflicts came to a close with a whimper. The resources on Dawn were no longer worth the money spent to secure them, and there were new wars to look forward to. Ariadna was recognized as a galactic power. Although they still claim that they own the Helio system and all of its resources, they controlled only small parts of the main continent, and their unremarkable planets Ushas and Oestris. O12 still controls the AEZ, the Ariadna Development Council, operated by Bureau Ganesh, is the effective government there, and works as a buffer covering the northern half of the continent, south of Rodina. Penumbra nanoclouds, deployed during the war, make communication sporadic, and anyone there has to rely on the communication towers as a lifeline. Many generations of bandits and hostile antipodes make the AEZ a dangerous place to live, but the plentiful TCM reserves make prospecting operations enticing for the brave and the foolish. The islands on Dawn are frequently engaged in low-level conflict, and they are the site of countless outposts, mines, and small military bases. For example, Novi Cimmeria is theoretically the richest source of rare metal on Dawn, but the region remains cold, desolate, and dangerous. Every power has military and scientific bases on Novi Cimmeria, and more than once, the human sphere has gone to war over the island's resources. Meanwhile, the Snarklands to the south went suspiciously quiet with the abrupt disappearance of the Shajia colony in 66 NC. The nomads fostered a long-term positive relationship with the Ariadans. Although there are still conflicts, they have some of the closest relations in the human sphere, and nomads are always given the best mining rights in the Helio system. O12 maintains acceptable relations with the Federation, since at the very least, O12 maintains Ariadna's legal right to controlling every planet that the colony ship Ariadne surveyed when it first arrived on Dawn. Hak Islam and its corporate interests fostered a great friendship with Ariadna during the war, establishing commercial alliances rather than territorial claims. Its few settlements on Abdera were seized on Pan Oceania, and Hak Islam ended the wars as the primary source of Corsairs and mercenaries rather than an active combatant. Pan Oceania and Yujing ended up controlling much of the territory outside the AEZ, but as always, much of the land is hostile and was not worth the effort to fully colonize. Pan Oceania remains an active player on Dawn. Locust agents are embedded in mercenary crews to gain better mining rights. Ariadna ended the war with a poor relationship to both powers, as well as Aleph, since Aleph represents the galactic community that exploited and fought Ariadna. Ariadna remains a puzzle piece that simply doesn't fit into the algorithm. The Ariadne Federation is a member of the galactic community. Internally, they suffer deep divisions, and their external threats see them as an opportunity to be exploited. Where does Ariadna go from here? Their civil rights movements stalled out during the wars. Their bioconservative government enforces strict rules on new technology. Their economy remains centuries behind the other powers. I'll give you one guess as to where Ariadna goes next. So, uh, <laughs> leave a comment and boost that out. This is the end of the video. Thank you for watching it. I spent a lot of time on it. More than was warranted, less than was necessary to make it into a good video. Thank you for all your subscriptions. I recently got to 1,000, which means I have two very, very special videos in the works now. You do not need to watch them, but maybe you will. I don't know. Happy Halloween.